So uh, we have our next session here. Uh, we have Vaibhav Srivastav. I'm sorry if I pronounce it wrong. That's perfect. And Vaibhav is a data scientist and a master's candidate at the University of Stuttgart. And um, the this topic is um, building petabyte scale ML models with Python. So great. Take it away. Perfect. Um, I'm just a quick check. You're able to see my screen, right? Oh yeah, everything works fine. Awesome. Perfect. All right. Well, good morning to everyone. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, building petabyte scale machine learning models with Python. Um, and before we get started, let's let's set some um, set some context over here, right? When it comes to machine learning or when it comes to building your um, um, building any deep learning ML model, you want two things. You want to be able to train your model faster, and you want to be able to reach a higher accuracy or whatever measure that you're tracking um, as soon as possible, right? Because if an experiment is going to fail, you want it to fail faster, right? You don't want to wait for say two three days, and then be um, and then get to know that this particular experiment failed. Um, and uh, these two charts over here um, sort of set the motivation quite quite all right. So on the left, you see um, we ran an experiment across um, across multiple number of workers, and um, we just benchmarked how fast uh, was the model um, able to sort of train. And you can see um, quite quite clearly over here that at around eight number of workers, we got about five x. Um, speed up. So what that means is that we were able to train the model five times faster than it would have been on just one device, right? Um, so we were able to get results five times faster, essentially. Um, what you see on the on the right is um, um, is that as we increase the number of workers, we were able to reach eighty percent accuracy um, uh, for our particular benchmark um, faster, right? So uh, for like one, this was about fifty units of time and um, whereas for eight this was roughly about 15 uh, or 16 and so on um so this is this effectively sort of helps us understand that we do not um really want to uh, run our experiments on just one machine and if we have uh, capability to run them on multiple machines then we should um and Here's a quick walkthrough of um, of what I'll be talking about. So um, we first talk about what exactly distributed machine learning is. We talk about out of core machine learning. Um, then we um, look at a couple of um, ways through which we can build uh, scalable workflows. Um, and then we briefly touch base upon which one should you use and when. Um, and then we head over to Q and A's. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat, and I can I can answer them later as well. Um, yeah. So. Uh, before we get into how do we actually build a distributed machine learning pipeline, let's talk about what exactly um, happens in a in a typical machine learning model, right? So for any machine learning exercise, you have some sort of data and you have a task, right? So this task can be, um, um, for the lack of better example, can be say stock price prediction, right? So you have certain um, uh, certain information or certain data regarding stock price of uh, Say S and P 500, right? And then you have um, a task which could be, you know, to predict the price of it, say tomorrow, day after, whatever it may be. So that's your task, uh, which is regression, right? And then you have some sort of a model. So this model could be a neural network, could be a linear model, um, and so on. And then you have a notion of quality, which is um, uh, which is effectively the loss, right? Which is how well is the model learning, um, whatever it is that you're throwing at it. Um, so that's your loss function, and then you have the you you basically have the optimizer which optimizes this loss, and um, you know essentially uh, tells the uh, tells the or nudges the model in a different direction when updating the weights, right? Um, and uh, this optimization is done using typically in a neural network setup is done using stochastic gradient descent, um, and I mean you can have uh, different optimizers and so on. Um, but yeah, that's that's the gist of how a machine learning exercise uh, exercise looks like. Typically, this would all um, work synchronously. So you will first have data, you will process it, then you will have the model, and then you like pass your uh, data to that model. You calculate the loss, and then you do this multiple times through epochs um, till the time your model is effectively trained, right? Um, and um, uh, this this is like synchronous. So one step happens after the other. Um, 
and while this is all good and chill um why why do we still need distributed machine learning because you can you can still just train it um one by one right you you, you can still train it on one device so why do we need um distributed machine learning and that's where um some of the most recent models if you if you look at so if you look at um in the realm of natural language processing we have gpt j level models you know which are billion parameter models so billion parameter models are kind of like the norm now right so you need to have um one massively huge um compute to one be able to just load that model let alone fine tune it or train it from scratch um and so on so you need so you need to be able to um load that model in the first place um which requires a lot of compute and second of all you might want to um use a lot of data to be able to train your model so in a typical say speech recognition uh, exercise you might throw in roughly about um you know 5000 to uh, 10000 hours of um audio data at your model for it to be able to learn the patterns within the speech and um you won't really be able to do that with just one device right um so you would you would want to be able to um scale your training across multiple devices and um, this sort of this is what we're we're going to be talking about in a bit um and second of all we just we effectively want uh, efficient computation for our algorithms right so if there's something that can be parallelized then we want it to be parallelized um that's the that's the key over here and we don't want to be running into out of memory errors and you know errors pertaining to um us not being able to uh, uh um, us not being able to uh, get to results faster and uh, so on and this is where um out of core machine learning comes in um so out of core ml is basically um a way to exploit external storage um when you have large data and uh, you know you cannot load all of your data into your um, GPU or your RAM, um, so you effectively take batches of data and then you throw it to the model, and the model learns on one batch, and then you throw in another batch, and then you throw in another batch, and model effectively learns on small, small snippets of data or like partitions of data, and um, then you um, then then you add up all of those gradients or, or whatever that loss is, and then you um, uh, optimize on that and so on and um this is this is something that that we typically use a lot uh when it comes to building large-scale models um or or just want to uh ensure that we do not get some sort of a out of memory error or um an error when we're um, effectively training the model so how does this look like uh, if we were to talk about in the same uh, way uh, as as we did at the start of the presentation so um again now we have some sort of a data set but now we can partition that data set into two partitions let's take two partitions so you have um say you say i have 100 rows then like data set partition one would have one uh, like zero up until the 50th or, or like the 49th uh, row whereas the data set partition two would have from 49 all uh, from 50 all the way till 99 right um and so we have these two partitions right we still have the same task we still have the same model right um, and and um, the the only thing that changes is the loss function. The loss function now only works on the first partition of data, whereas in the second case, it it only works on the second partition of the data. And then the optimizer effectively just adds, um, uh, you know, adds both the losses and then optimizes further, right? Um, and we just looked into the use case of having two partitions, but we can have multiple partitions. So we can have four partitions, six partitions, ten partitions, and so on. And each of this each of these partitions can uh, can effectively work parallelly right so i can have um one of this uh, one of this partition being trained separately on one gpu and i can have this uh, partition being trained on another gpu parallelly at the same time and then um at the optimization scale um time i can just add all of these up right so um in this way we we effectively uh, cut the synchrony of us waiting and um, we parallelize the entire uh, operation across uh, across these gpus to be able to then um, then train the model faster so this way like just in this case roughly we get roughly about 1.75 to 1.65 uh, x speed up um, because the only only process only blocking process here is the um, is the optimization process right everything else can be easily parallelized 
Um, and this is effectively something which all deep learning or uh, machine learning libraries now use. Um, so this is called a mirroring strategy and we will get, um, and, and you effectively mirror your model along with um, uh, your model and you just pass it different uh, data partition. Um, so how does this happen in, in real life? So one is by using um, partial fit and we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in a bit. And the second is that you, you sort of use some sort of a um, deep learning framework like, I don't know, TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, JAX, um, whatever the new frameworks keep on coming in and you use their distributed training APIs, which will effectively do this for you, right? So you so you create a model and then you can you can tell it that this is the, uh, these are the device IDs um, or like these are the GPU IDs that I want my um, model to be uh, pushed on and you know trained on. So as long as the, the the GPU itself can load your model and can can process the minimum batch size that you've given to it, uh, or the batch size that you that you've given to it, the uh, uh, the model training would happen in a distributed fashion. Um, what partial fit does? This is this is typically useful for like low resource. Um, um, like when you have low compute, you don't have say. Um, Five six GPUs on your hand, and you just have uh, you're 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 um, training a statistical ML model with say cycle tone or something like that, and uh, you have say seven eight gigabytes of data, and your RAM just cannot fit all the data in one go. Uh, in in that case, you use partial fit, wherein you um, just give it um, some batches of data in like, one by one synchronously, and then um, the model effectively. Uh, trains on those smaller batches and, and keeps on updating the um, the weights and so on. So both of these methods are 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 equally used um, um, in in practice. Um, if you if if you're more deep learning uh, focused, then you would want to be able to you know use say PyTorch or say TensorFlow um, or JAX nowadays. Uh, but if you're using uh, if you're building statistical models, then you would want to just use something like Dask um, along with Scikit-Learn. Uh, to just do partial fit for large data use cases. Um, so now we we get to the point of how do we actually build these uh, scalable machine learning workflows. So there's the first scenario wherein like um, you have some sort of legacy code base wherein um, you have a machine learning workflow written in scikit-learn stats models or something like that. And the second one would be wherein you're um, you're building a new experiment. Um, from scratch, or you're creating a new uh, experiment from scratch. Um, in um, both of those cases, um, in the first case with like the second learn one, um, um, the the more um, acceptable approach right now would be to use um, something like Dask to create data batches, and then you use uh, incremental pipelines uh, provided by Dask to uh, train your model uh, on on these smaller batches. Um, for more deep learning uh, based models or for like um, new models, you use uh, something like tf.data uh, or, or, or its equivalent in whichever framework you're using to create data batches. And you use something like torch.nn.data parallel or tf.distribute strategy to load your model on, on, on separate um, um, GPUs and then train your model um, and so on. Uh, so before I get to these, um, these links, I, I, I put in some collab links um, in the slides, uh, which you could quite easily just run and 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 see how distributed training works with Dusk um, and with, with with TensorFlow. I wouldn't be going through those right now in the interest of time, but I do want to um, um, quickly show you how easy it is to do um, distributed model training with um, uh, with PyTorch. So um, this is the DDP page, which is distributed data pap parallel page, um, which is a module within torch.nn. And um, um, it's, it's, it's relatively simple, right? So you first just set device. So um, set device could be uh, just, just one GPU or could be multiple GPUs. Um, you know, it could be say three, four, however number of GPUs you have in your cluster, you just pass all the IDs for those. Um, and, and, you know, or you can just set them up uh, in the environment variable of CUDA visible devices and so on. Um, and um, uh, then you you effectively just create um, the distributed group, um, and then you just pass your like you pass your model as a distributed data parallel model, and um, you you 
provide all the device IDs that you want this model to be trained on and you provide an output device. So this can be any of the GPUs or can be CPU as well. Um, and then you effectively train the module, right? So it's literally three lines of code that you have to add. If, if, if you have a legacy PyTorch code, you can, you can use a distributed data parallel to be able to um, um, parallelize your uh, model training or distribute your model training across uh, multiple GPUs and so on. Um, similarly, if you have TensorFlow um, code, then again, you can um, use something like tf.distribute uh, strategy. So one sec. Yeah, so you can, there are multiple strategies that you can use with um, with TensorFlow depending upon where you wrote your code. So if you use, if you wrote your um, code using Keras, then you can use something like mirrored strategy or TPU strategy. There are um, uh, different strategies for different use cases. Um, mirrored strategy is is the one that we spoke about, wherein like you load the model along with the partition in one of the GPUs, and then like once the uh, once the training is done on that particular, uh, or like once the model's gone through that particular batch and has has a loss value, then it aggregates all the losses across all the GPUs and then updates the model uh, updates the model weights. Um, there is if you're if you're using with TPUs, then there is another TPU strategy for it. Um, and so on. So um, it's and and this is as easy as um, as literally just um, using tf dot distribute strategy, um, and and um, calling the mirrored strategy and passing your GPU IDs as you see over here, um, and 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 that's pretty much it. Um, once you once you do that, it effectively automatically takes the model um, from the uh, from the code that you've written and uh, mirrors it across the devices that you've passed to it, um, and you can you can see that quite quite clearly in the collabs that have uh, updated um, that have put into this um, slides. These slides are already on the um, uh, sched uh, schedule, so you can you, you can just go up to the talk and click on download the slides, and then you should be able to access these collabs um, as well. Um, so now, now comes the million dollar question. We spoke about Dask, we spoke about uh, PyTorch, we spoke about TensorFlow, which one should you use um, and, uh, and, and when. Uh, to this, uh, I, I put forth um, the most cited um, quote, which is there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. So um, uh, typically you would, you would, you would, if you're doing something from scratch, uh, and and if it's deep learning related, um, it's advised or it, it's 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 a good call to use something like PyTorch or TensorFlow uh, for your experiments because they they provide very nice APIs to be able to just distribute your model across devices. Um, if you're um, if you're building a statistical model or just building um, classical machine learning models in Scikit-Learn, then it's a very good idea to. Uh, parallelize it with with task and avoid out of memory errors um, and so on. So, um, um, so that's what my recommendation would be. But but then again, um, it it depends a lot on what your exact use cases are. Whether you have access to GPUs, whether you have access to only CPUs, whether you're constrained by RAM and so on. Um, but typically, these two solutions or or like these three solutions that we spoke about, uh, if you consider TensorFlow and PyTorch as separate solutions, um, is something that um, would help you out. So, um, do do you do look at all, all three options depending upon what your use case is. Um, with that, thank you. Thank you so much.